You guys get a little something a little different for getting the youth guy to come preach Sunday morning. Um, so I need a couple of my youth kids to come up. Most of you guys, hopefully most of you, unless you had a sheltered childhood, knows, knows what's about to take place. All right, come up here, kids. All right, we're doing that. All right, go ahead, Chase. Do your thing. Now, for those of you who don't know, this is a volcano. And uh, they're going to make it erupt. River, put some of yours in. No, not coming out. That's all right. That's just for looks, anyways. There we go. All right, perfect. All right, Hunter, light us up. There we go. It might got a little bit more left in it. Let's see. There we go. Now, I'm not a science expert, but I do know that whatever was in this thing and whatever was in this thing caused a reaction, which caused that to happen. Um, so in our passage today, I'll leave that up there so we can keep reminded. Thanks, kids. You can go sit down. Give them a hand. So turn in your Bibles with me to Numbers, Numbers chapter 20. To give you a little history on our passage, um, we're talking about Moses and the Israelites in the wilderness. Um, they've left Egypt, obviously a long time ago. They've wandered in the wilderness. They've gone to Mount Sinai. They've gotten the Ten Commandments. Um, they've sent the spies into the Promised Land. They came out. They said, okay, it's too scary. The guys are too big. We're not going in. And so God said, okay, you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. So they've wandered in the wilderness, and they're coming to the, close to the end of their 40 years. So you can imagine Moses. Moses at this time was an old man. He had been with the Israelite people for a long time and had to deal with them for a long time. So that brings us to our story today. So Moses, or, uh, Numbers chapter 20 verses 1 through 12. It says, Then the children of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron, and the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Why have you brought us up? Why have you brought up the assembly of our Lord into this wilderness that we and our animals should die here? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. So Moses and Aaron went, went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and they fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock and said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, 
and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. I don't know if you guys have probably have seen in the news about people that react to different things. I was reading a story um, in Walmart in Michigan right before school started. There was two women getting school supplies for their children. There was a, there was a single notebook left on the shelf. One woman grabbed it. I don't know exactly how the whole scenario played out, but there was somewhat of a fight over probably a 50-cent notebook and the woman pulls a gun on the other woman. So that's where two people come together, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and all of a sudden, boom, somebody reacts, or they both react. I think all of us, to a certain extent, react to different situations, different circumstances. Another situation, um, two drivers, of course, Nothing ever happens while we're driving. We're all calm and collected when we're driving. Um, one person had a political bumper sticker. Don't know what, how it happened. They drove up side by side and were arguing, and one person pulled a gun on the other person over a political bumper sticker. And, I mean, we, this could go on and on and on. I mean, this, we get these stories almost daily of people that react in ridiculous ways for ridiculous circumstances. But... As, as far out as some of those circumstances are, we sometimes will react in certain situations in ways that we maybe shouldn't react. In our passage today, we hear about Moses who reacted in a way that he wasn't supposed to. A reacted in a way that was substantiated, that could have been justified but not what God wanted him to do. So we're going to look at three things. So the first point today is that we react to others instead of relying on God. Um, Moses did something in this passage right, um, where most of us fail when we react in a situation. Um, in verse, uh, let's see where we're at. In verse, so the children of Israel come to him, say, Moses, we're dying here. Why'd you bring us out here? Um, do something for us. So Moses immediately goes before the Lord. He's like, God, what do you want us to do? And Moses, Moses was an, an extremely amazing man of God. Um, if you read his life, what he had to deal with, what he had to go through, um, there's multiple places in the Bible to say that he was a super humble man. Um, he was a wise man. So he went before God like he always did before every situation and says, okay, your people are coming to me. There's no water. What do you want me to do? So God tells him, you know, what to do, um, exactly what he wants him to do. Um, but how many times do we react without even thinking about how does God want me to respond in this situation? What does God want me to do? I mean, it could be a really hurtful comment. I mean, we always say about Facebook, people say things on Facebook that they never say to your face, um, texting, whatever. All the time, we're having to deal with people that cause us to react in a certain way. And how often do we react to a person out of, could be anger, frustration, well, fine, I'm going to tell them what I think kind of thing. I see it all the time, maybe you're at, Home Depot or Lowe's and someone, there's nobody to help you and nobody knows what they're talking about and um, maybe they, like for me, they send you the wrong product on the job every single time and you just want to give them a piece of your mind and say, listen, how does God want us to react? And maybe there are times that a reaction like that is appropriate, but do we spend the time and say, a few seconds and say, God, how, how Am I to respond in this situation? In Psalms, in Psalm 17, 6, it says, I have called upon you, for you will hear me, O God. Incline your ear to me and hear my speech. God wants us to cry out to him. 
God is concerned about our, our situations. God is concerned about the little details in our lives of how we respond to people that we interact with. It's, it's a big reflection on God, how we react. So God says, cry out to me. Talk to me. He's going to hear us when we call him. And also, when we deal with those people that drive us crazy, drive us nuts, we don't like. Because Moses, frankly, probably didn't like the children of Israel very well. He had to deal with problems day in and day out. I don't think he was a huge fan of the Israelites. Um, but in Matthew 5.44 Matthew 5.44 says, But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. There's, there's going to there's gonna be people out there that are going to use you, that are going to hurt you, that are going to do things to you that are wrong. And by rights, we have all rights to lash out, whatever. But God says to pray, pray for those that despitefully use you. And I can think probably everyone here can think of a time when someone else used them for whatever. Um, there's been multiple times where people, you know, come to you, especially in churches. People come to churches saying, oh, we're, we need this, we need that. And I'm not saying we shouldn't, you know, we should give to them and help them. But a lot of times you find out they didn't need help. They were just using you. And so in those times, we want to lash out. We want to react. We want to kind of blow up a little bit. Um, but we need to pray. We need to go before God and say, how do we react? Pray for them because they need the Lord. Second point is we react to circumstances instead of relying on God. A lot of times our circumstances determine our response. Um, think of Moses, Moses' situation here. Okay, his sister had just died. Um, I don't know if I've never, I haven't lost a sister, but I can imagine Moses was going through some sort of grief over his sister just dying. Okay? He has spent 40 years in the wilderness with these people. These people have complained and complained and complained and complained against him. He's been attacked on every side. Even his brother and his sister attacked him at one point in time. Um, so Moses has been attacked on every front, pretty much, for doing God's work. Doing something he didn't even want to do, he didn't want to sign up for. But God had called him to this. And he had dealt with it for 40 years. And I don't know if I've dealt with a few people for a few years and been like, man, I am through with these people. I'm just going to wash them out and be done. You know, I don't care what happens to them. I just don't want to see their face ever again. And Moses had dealt with these people for 40 years. I mean, he, in this very passage, they're coming to him not like, oh, we need a drink, we're thirsty. They came to contend with Moses. It says they came against Moses. It says they gathered together against Moses and Aaron, and the people contended with Moses. This wasn't just a plea for help. This was a, uh, Moses, fix this right now. This is your problem. You need to fix it for us. We're going to die out here. Fix it. And Moses was probably up to here with them after 40 years. And he was going through grief. You know, can't you just give me a break? My sister just died. I'm, I'm feeling it. I'm down. And a lot of times when we're in those situations, we're stressed up to here. We justify our responses by saying, man, I'm just, I can't handle anything anymore. And so we <laughs> blow it. And it can, it can be over just a tiny little thing. It could be just hardly nothing. But our circumstances around us, justifies our reaction to a situation, that it could just be a little minute thing and we blow up over someone. And a lot of times it's maybe someone that we love and care for or whatnot, but our circumstances make us 
erupt, even though the situation may not be that big of a deal. Let's flip the scales here a little bit. Let's look at the children of Israel for a second and their circumstances and Israel's reaction. Israel now has been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. They have seen God um, give them food. They've, seen that they've already seen God bring water from a rock before. They've seen God bring quail. They've seen God pretty much provide for all their needs, maybe not all their wants. They're still in the wilderness. They're still living in tents. Probably not great. But all their needs are provided for every single time. They've seen God part the Red Sea out of Egypt. I mean, these people have been through or have seen a lot. Now, granted, we're at the end of the 40 years. We've got to remember that there's not too many people that have seen the Red Sea parting are still alive at this point. There's probably a lot that have already passed away and died. But they still know about what God has done, that God has always provided their needs. And here, yet again, they're coming against Moses. Now, I, d I don't typically like to make parallels between Israel and the church, but I think there's some things as the church that we can take from, from this scenario. Our pastor, I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not the normal pastor, so I can preach on this. Our pastor deals with a lot of stuff in our church. He's, in, in retrospect, a Moses of our congregation. And we need to be careful on how we approach our pastor. That we lift our pastors up before the Lord. They are the spiritual leaders. Yes, they do have to deal with a lot of problems that go on in our churches. But how we respond to our pastors or respond to something going on in our churches that needs to be brought to the attention of our pastor can, can make a big difference in our pastor's life. Moses, I'm going to read a passage in Psalms real quick about Moses. Um, Psalms 106. Psalms 106, 32 and 33. Psalms 106, 32 and 33 says... They angered him also at the waters of strife, so that it went ill with Moses on the account of them, because they rebelled against his spirit, so he spoke rashly with his lips. Right there in Psalms, it talks about how Moses reacted because of what the people were saying to him. That because of the Israelites, it's not, I'm not saying I'm justifying Moses' action in this passage. Moses responded because Israel was continually pushing Moses. And our pastors can get beaten down if we continually react to situations in our churches instead of being willing to partner with our pastors to help with things in our churches. Um, the way we go about coming before our pastors with issues or things in our churches can greatly reduce. And if we go to our pastors and encourage them, it can really affect our pastors. And we need to encourage them not, not look the other way at problems. I'm not saying don't, don't say anything. But I'm saying how we respond to things can make, the, make all the difference in the world. And pray about it. Pray about it before you go to the pastor. We really be interceding with what God wants for our churches, for our pastors, in issues that go on. Whenever you deal with people, whenever you have a congregation like this, there's going to be conflicts. There's going to be problems. People aren't going to see eye to eye. Nowhere. You can go anywhere. Nobody's going to see eye to eye on anything. But we need to go back to what the Bible says and pray about it. What does God want? Because that's, that's the only thing that mattered in Moses' situation. That only matters in our churches today is what does God want for our church? What does God want? In Moses' time, Moses was justified, but he did something that was definitely wrong. It was not what God wanted. 
deserve, did Israel deserve it? Yes, Israel deserved to be called rebels. They were. They were definitely rebellious against God all the time. And Israel always lived in the past. Almost every time they had a conflict, had a problem, they were like, man, we had it so good in Egypt. We should have gone back to Egypt. Why don't you leave us in Egypt? We had food there. Yeah, we were slaves. They didn't care about us. But they forgot about, they forgot about the bad things and just remembered the good things. They had food and water in Egypt, yes, but they were slaves. They were to do hard manual labor day in and day out. Now, I'm, I don't remember the good old days, as some people call them. Um, but I, I live in a house, and I bought a house that was through the good old days. And when I first moved in, when, when our, we first moved in there, there was no, no insulation in the walls. No insulation in the ceiling. The windows were super old. They had trash bags shoved in the cracks. And, well, we did a whole lot of stuff before we moved in there. But even after insulating the ceiling, without insulation in the walls or replacing the windows yet, Robin had to sleep with a hoodie. And it was freezing. Even, even running the wood stove, you know, running the pellet stove, um, and I'm like, man, I don't know what the good old days were, but these guys lived worse than this, so I don't, know how, I don't know how they lived like this in the good old days. So there was a lot of good things back then. We have a lot of things today that they didn't have to deal with back then. So there was definitely good things back then, and probably some of you can come up and tell us about how good the good old days were. But I think there was a lot of things in the past, and as River studies history and some of the things that went on in the good old days, they had it rough, and we got it pretty easy. Um, so Israel always, always went back and said, well, back then it was so much better. Back then it was better. And I think sometimes we can do that as we grow up into churches and stuff. Well, this is the way we did it back then. This is the way it should be done because this is the way back then or Whatever, something happened in the past, something was good in the past, you know, this pastor in the past did it this way, and that was so great, and, and what? We can't live in the past. We've got to focus on the future. And if, if Israel had been focused on the future back then, when they went into Canaan and took the land when they were supposed to take it, in a land with milk and honey and not be wandering in the wilderness, they would have had food in plenty they won't be going through all the stuff they're going through now. But because of their disobedience to God is why they were living like they were living now. Why they were in a place that had no water. And so they need to be looking on towards what the future was. The future was the promised land that they were getting ready to take in fairly short time. Not, not too many passages after this. They were going into the land of Canaan. And Israel, and the last thing, Israel always had a spirit of taking and never a spirit of giving. When we feel like that we're always the one hurt, we're always the one that's, that's being torn down, that people owe it to us, we don't have the spirit of giving. Israel always was give me, give me, give me. We need water, we need food, we need whatever. And so Israel had the, the spirit of taking. And the spirit of taking is not in the Bible. In the Bible says, put others' needs before your own. That we are to be people that are always looking towards other people's needs instead of our own needs. And so when we focus on our own needs, we have the spirit that people owe us. Now, yeah, we, we could be going through tough times. We could be going through hard times. And God hopefully has given someone else to come alongside of you. But even in those hard times, we need to have the spirit of giving to others because God wants us to have the giving attitude, the giving spirit, not always looking at ourselves, but looking towards others. Which brings us to our third point is we, we react to others instead of responding to God. I don't get this, it's really close to my first point. 
which is reacting to others instead of relying on God. Because we rely on God to tell us what to do, but Moses in this situation really was respond, should have been responding to God instead of responding to someone else. Um, he responded to Israel when he should have been responding to God. And most of the time that comes on, like I just talked about, about focusing on ourselves instead of God and others. Back to our passage. Um, when Moses, when God tells Moses what to do and he goes before the rock and he talks to the people and he says, um, in verse 10, he says, Moses and Aaron gathered all the people together before the rock and he said to them, hear now you rebels. I'm not going to hear the anger in his voice. Hear now you rebels. Must we, meaning Aaron and Moses, must we bring water out of this rock? Let's see, let me find my place again. Must we bring water for you out of this rock? Moses took his focus off of God, bringing the water forth out of the rock, and brought it to the focus on him. Must we, him and Aaron, bring water out of this rock for you? He turned it into a personal attack on him, and he was attacking back, reacting back to the people of Israel. And so when we turn to insulting others, you rebels, how often and how easy it is when we get attacked to attack back, to focus on our hurts. I've been hurt, so I'm going to shove it back in your face. And it's so easy for us to insult others. And insulting others never brings them to God and never makes them see God in you. In James, in James chapter 5, verse 9, it says, Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge stands at the door. Okay, we're not the judge. You and I are not the judge. People will get their judgment for what they say. We, we want to dish out the judgment. They hurt us. It's only natural for us to want to hurt someone back, to throw it back at them, to react like the volcano. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you ten times worse. And, but then we become the judge. We're not here to judge people. God's going to judge everybody at the end. At the end, we're all going to be judged for what we do. We're not here to judge people. Now, yes, we are here to uphold God, God's holiness, God's word. As leaders in a church, we're here, we're here to shepherd the flock to make sure we keep the wolves out of the flock. So sometimes we need to stand up to sin and unrighteousness. But we are not here to judge people. Insults back at people. We're here to show the love of Christ. When we focus on ourselves instead of God, we take the credit instead of God. Moses took the credit for what was happening here instead of God. And when we do that, we're taking the glory away from God. Moses was becoming just like the Israelites, okay? They were attacking each other, but they were doing the same thing and rebelling against God. Israel was rebelling against God, saying, give us water, we want it now. Moses was rebelling against God because he was taking God's credit for what God was going to do in letting the water out. So in this very moment, Moses was becoming like the Israelites. When we when we throw insults back at a person, we're becoming just like them and doing the same wrong, bad thing that they're doing and not allowing God's glory to be seen. And if you guys want to know how important God views his glory, when we take God's glory away, just back in Leviticus, 
a story of Aaron's two sons as they were starting up the temple, the temple practices. In verses 10, um, verse 1 through 3, it says, Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and put incense in it and offered a profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded. So the fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke to me. By those who came near to me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all people, I must be glorified. That is the importance God places on taking away his glory that should have been given to him. These two men lost their lives because of it, because they did something that God had not commanded for their own glory instead of the glory of God. And that's what, that's what Moses did. He took away um, God's glory from him. And it says, to those who came near to me, it is especially important for people in leadership and for people who call themselves Christians to not take God's glory away. These two men were priests, so they got judged accordingly. But each one of us has access to God today. We don't have the priest system anymore because we have direct access to God. So in reality, each one of us, if we are Christians, if we have accepted Christ's death on the cross as saviors, each one of us are a priest because we have direct access to the throne of God. And so how serious is it for us if we are in a situation and we react when we can be showing God's glory, when we can be showing God's love to that person. We don't know what that person's going through. We don't know they could be hurting, they could be reacting because of circumstances in their lives, and they need the love of Christ, not someone to shove insults in their face. Yes, they probably hurt you, and you're justified in what you're saying back to them, but God may have another plan in your response um, to them. Now, there are times when anger is appropriate. We see Jesus in the temple driving out um, the money changers. He was angry. He made a whip. There are times for us to be, to stand up and to be upset and angry over something. When we see injustice, when we see someone getting hurt because of something else, we need to stand up for them. We need to be careful that we do it God's way in God's timing. And Moses, as we continue on down this story, he was supposed to speak to the rock and the water was to come forth. So in a moment of anger, he insulted the people, took God's glory for himself, and then he struck the rock twice with his staff. Now if you look back, in the story before, when, he's, when God brings water from the rock earlier um, in their time in the wilderness, God commanded him to strike the rock with his rod. Um, so I think Moses, in this bit of anger, kind of goes back to what worked before. He strikes the rock twice, give it an extra, give it an extra whack, just just cause. I don't. None of us do that. Just hit it, hit it one more time frustrated with something. I've never done that. I've never hit something an additional time with my hammer just because I was frustrated with something. Okay? Moses was frustrated. He was angry. He went back. He wasn't paying attention to what God had commanded him in this situation and hit that rock twice again because he hit it the last time with his rod. Now, why God commanded him differently in two different situations, I don't know why. There's a lot of different theories of different pictures that they were trying to portray. I think God was trying to say, hey, let them see my glory by not even using your rod. Moses used his rod for not everything, but nearly everything he did. He had his rod. Well, he had his rod there on pretty much everything, and he used it in a lot of the plagues in Egypt. I mean, he used it all the time. God 
using his power through Moses' rod. You know, he threw it down and made a snake. He had all that kind of stuff. So I think God was saying, okay, let the people see it, that your rod is not just a magical rod, that your rod is a tool used by God, and there's nothing necessarily special about the rod. But I, don't, but I don't know for sure why God commanded him to use a rod once and not use it, not use it a second time. But I think Moses just kind of reverted back to the past. This is the way God wanted me to do it this, that time, let me do it this time. And sometimes in our lives, we can sometimes say, well, this worked in the past, this worked back then, so I'm just going to, I'm not even going to pray about it, I'm just going to, this is, this is what God wants me to do this time. God works in different ways in different situations. God might even want you to not say anything to someone who's mad at you, or you're mad at them, somebody who wronged you. Maybe God wants you to say something. God works differently in different situations. God knows the heart of the people that are around you. And we need to be sensitive to what God wants to do through us. God may have a new plan. So are people going to see God through your response to them? Or is all people going to see is a big, ugly volcano? That's, they, they do the wrong thing. They push the wrong buttons. And it's going to erupt. And things are going to be said and people are going to be mad. And nobody sees God in any of it. So make sure that when we're, when we're re- reacting to others, that we are relying on God, that, that when we react to circumstances, that we are relying on God instead of just the circumstances, and that we react to others instead of responding to God. I'm going to close with one, one passage, Romans chapter 12, one of my favorite, favorite passages of Scripture. Romans 12, verses 17 through 21. It says, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peace with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in doing, you will heap coals of head of fire on his head. And do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now Moses had a Moses had a price to pay for what he did. Here he had taken these people out of Egypt, done all these mighty things. He had wandered in the wilderness for forty years. And he has known about the promised land from the get-go. But he was never going to step foot in the promised land because of it. And when we react outside of God's will, outside of what God wants for our lives, we're going to miss the blessings that God has for us. And remember that Romans 12 passage that that we overcome evil with good because it's so easy. It's so easy to feel hurt, to feel abandoned, to feel mad at somebody because they messed something up, did something wrong. I mean, when we get into our day-to-day lives, into our working lives, to our daily routine, it's so easy to forget about things, especially, you know, in my life, you know, you're working, construction isn't always the easiest field to keep your Christian testimony always when you're dealing with guys and people that mess things up. So, but just remember that, you know, what what really matters? Them seeing Christ in you or you getting the last word in? Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for, for your word, Lord. Thank you for this lesson of Moses. Um, I pray that He would help each one of us that we'd react according to how you'd want us to react, that we'd respond to people in a way that brings you glory, that brings you all the praise, that people would see you and us, even though they've hurt us, Lord, even though they've 
done, th- done things to us, um, that we would always give you the praise and the honor and the glory and show that in the lives that we live. Um, we just thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.